Lonzo Ball's a good kid. His dad has a big mouth. Everyone knows it, but that's okay. If I still had my dad, I would wish him to be the same way. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster and the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're going to look back at a five-game Wednesday. We're going to preview a five-game Thursday and I reckon I might be able to get you guys out of here in under an hour today. So let's get to it. Let's get to it indeed. We will start with the monstrous line of the night and it goes to Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors. Who was uh? It was pretty good. I think it's. I think that's fair to say he was uh. He was impressive. There were a ton of other guys who were challenging for the uh for the monstrous line of the night, and uh, they they all came from the Orlando Magic. But Steph in the end gets over the line with his big performance for the Warriors. Steph had 22 points, but the real value came in his other numbers: two triples, eight assists, eight rebounds, two steals, and a block. He was a perfect six of six from the free throw line as well, which always helps. When you can get that level of uh, that level of production from the uh, from the free throw line, or that level of um, um, efficiency, I guess from the free throw line. So Steph Curry is your monstrous line of the night. He is the sixth ranked player overall this season, putting up numbers which exactly sort of where you would have drafted him. You're getting that that sort of return. You're hitting his shots at 47 percent, 93 percent from the line. You really can't complain too much about the sort of production. That, uh, that Steph is giving you, and that's uh, exactly what you want out of your first round draft pick. The waiver wire line of the night is one of Steph's teammates, and it is Omri Caspi, who played the 20 minutes here with Kevin Durant out. He had 13 points, and he looked fantastic down the stretch. A triple, three rebounds, one assist, but the defensive numbers is where the value really came in from Caspi. Two steals and three blocks. He is owned in, according to Yahoo, 0% of leagues. He won't play every night. He accumulated five fouls in 20 minutes. He's playing here because Kevin Durant is out, but it just goes to show you just how awesome the depth is on the Warriors that he doesn't have to play every night. Andre Iguodala started in place of Durant, and then they can just slide Caspi in for those backup minutes, and he looked absolutely awesome in that playing time. So, um, yeah, nothing to really see for dynasties. Even he's 29 years of age, so he's not going to like you know, jump up and start taking big leaps forward or on another team. But the fact that the Warriors were able to sign Caspi and teams like the Pelicans, who had him last year and then just cut him, which was a, one of the more ludicrous moves of last season, um, it just shows that you know, having competent management and ownership is such a massive, massive part of success in the NBA. And Omri Caspi, just another signal of that with another big performance. But in terms of fantasy output, there's nothing really to see here from Caspi. Deep leagues, dynasties, is not a huge amount to gain from uh, from looking too closely at Omri Caspi's performance. The young gun of the night. Now, people might look at this and go, Josh, how's uh, how's Lonzo Ball, the young gun of the night? Well, the reason is is because he's defensive numbers. Yeah, he had nine points and he was four of 15 from the field. He hit a triple, but these other numbers are actually pretty good. Five rebounds, six assists, one steal, and four blocks from Lonzo. And those defensive numbers are really impressive. And for a guy who's been, let's be honest, shithouse this season, his, his fantasy numbers are okay. 6.3 rebounds out of a point guard is really good. 6.8 assists out of a rookie point guard is really good. 1.1 steals and 0.9 blocks out of a point guard, yeah, fantastic. 29% from the field? Yeah, not really. 54% from the line? A- atrocious. Now, we knew he was going to have some field goal percentage issues and some shooting and scoring issues, and they have manifested in a in a way that I didn't think would actually be this significant. Um, we knew he was a free throw issue guy in uh, in college. Didn't think it would be this poor. But what we did know is he was going to be an aggressive rebounder. Check, that's happening. He was going to get his assists. Check, that's happening. He was going to be a really good source of blocks as a point guard. Absolutely happening. And he was going to get some steals. He would have hoped for a few more steals, but he is still getting his steals. So those numbers are fine. So you can talk about dropping Lonzo, despite the absolute shitfulness in his shooting and in his scoring. He is still the 113th ranked player, and those numbers have to improve. Now, how far they improve, I don't know. Will he be able to shoot 40% from the field? I would say probably not. Can he get to 37 and 60 from the field and from the line? That should be his expectation. That adds another couple of points on, adds maybe half a three onto his numbers, and then it pushes him back inside the top 100. So when you're owning, and just burn this into your brain. 
when you are drafting rookies or and rookie guards especially, your field goal percentage is going to hurt in a big, big way. We've seen Markel Fultz do it already. You're seeing Lonzo Ball. You're seeing Dennis Smith. You're seeing Don Mitchell. They are just going to obliterate your field goal percentage. Rookies in general will do that. We have Kyle Kuzma. We have Jason Tatum who are proving that not to be correct. Um, but they are the exception. And they are also forwards who are playing at the four. You got Benny Simmons, who is a completely different story altogether as a power forward playing as a point guard who's had one year uh, in the NBA system to get some of those issues out of his system. But he's not going to be immune to poor games in terms of his shooting percentage either. Malik Monk, another guy who's just horrendous in terms of field goal percentage. This is something you need to burn into your brain is that especially in the October, October, November, December portion of your season, they're going to kill you. And, and it, there's just no way around it. You'll get the exception who doesn't, but they will kill you. And you'll see maybe a 3 4 5% rise from these guys next season, and maybe another 3 or 4% rise from these guys the following season. So just don't be... Um, yeah, don't, don't be looking at it and going, oh, I can't deal with this. This is what you should have had some expectation of happening. Now, again, not to this level with Lonzo, not 29%. You weren't hoping that. And 22% over his last four games is atrocious. But you should have had some expectation that, yeah, the scoring is going to be rough. And that's something that I talked about pretty consistently on this podcast about that uh, about that scoring issue with Lonzo Ball. The dud of the night is Darren Collison of the Indiana Pacers. Dazza struggled quite a bit. 7-2-3 with a steal. 3-10 of 10 from the field and 1-1 one of one from the line. He is still the 65th ranked player this season. But over the last week, his numbers have dwindled. And that's mainly because he's shooting 37% in that time. He's the 163rd ranked player in that time frame, 9, 2.5, and, and 6, with that field goal percentage dropping from 48 down to 37. And that's really why he, his value has dropped as significantly as it has over that time period. The assists are still fine. The scoring drops in conjunction with the field goal percentage drop. Yeah, someone tweeted me today, oh, are we worried about Corey Joseph taking these minutes off Darren Collison? I'm not. It was just a, a poor shoe night, and he's had a couple of them recently, no doubt about it. But in his past four games... He had a 30% night tonight. The game before, he was 56. The game before that, he was 46. And the game before that, he was at 11. So you see that he's just up and down. In fact, you go back over his games for the season. 75, 56, 33, 55, 42, 40, 0, 90, 11, 46, 56, and 30. They're all his field goal percentages. So he's just way really up and down. He could have a string of three 60% games in a row, and that will bring his value back up, and he'll start scoring 13 points a game. You'll get an extra minute on the court, and all his other numbers will be fine. So I'm not doing anything panic-wise regarding Daz Collison here. It wasn't a great night for him. Yeah, Corey Joseph got some extra playing time, but it's not looking at. I'm not looking at it going, oh, shit, yeah, Collison's going to lose this job because Corey Joseph's not really that good, and, and Collison's been playing well for the majority of the season, well, the majority of the season that, uh, that, I've, been, that I've been paying attention to. Or actually, that's not because that's not true because I've been paying attention to the, the whole season. There's been some moments where he struggled, but overall, it's been a good season from Darren Collison. Let's, uh, let's go with that instead. Now we're going to look at all five of these games from Wednesday. So let's get stuck into that right now. All right, bring those up for you guys to have a look at. The first game was the Indiana Pacers and the Detroit Pistons. This was a game where Miles Turner got himself into early foul trouble. 26 minutes only for Turner, 8 and 6 with two steals and a block. And with DeMontis Sabonis out, Al Jefferson got some extra run. And he looked like uh, old Al Jefferson. 19 and 6 in 22 minutes for Al with a steal on 70% shooting. Hit all five of his free throws. You can chalk this one up to a large, large anomaly. He won't get these minutes. He won't be in the rotation every night. And he won't get the opportunity afforded to him by Turner's absence to be able to put up this playing time. So I wouldn't get too overly excited about Al Jefferson. While Sabonis is out, you can look at him in, uh, in deeper leagues. But that's about it. As for Corey Joseph, who I referenced earlier, 11-3-6 and six in 29 minutes. More a streamer on these five-game nights than anything else. The Deuce Young, strong once again, 16-6-4 six and four for Thad, while Oladipo had 21-3-2, and two, a steal and a block. The efficiency was poor. The fouls were there, but at least he still got the 38 minutes. On to the Pistons. Toby Harris, man. I know, I know I write this a lot, and I say it a lot, but remember last season when the tackle box, John Lewis was playing more minutes than Toby Harris? What an asinine move. It just makes no sense, and it it I look. I'm and I'm all for coaches realizing their mistakes and correcting it, and that's what Stan Van Gundy has done with Harris, who had 23 and eight with five triples. It just looks really, really good this year. Reggie Jackson also looks strong, 18-3 and six, while Drummond 14 and 21. 
awesome. Four assists, awesome. A block, awesome. Seven of nine from the field, fantastic. Zero of seven from the line. And I got multiple tweets. Oh, no. Oh, no, it's back. Oh, no. Andre Drummond, the free throws are back. I'm not ready to say that yet. That's a shit night, no doubt. That's a horrible, horrible night. I'm not ready to say that he's going back to being a 35% free throw shooter. He did it over preseason. He did it over the first 10, 11 games of the season. And that's a, a situation where it's not a, it's not a minuscule sample size. But neither is the first four or five years of his career where he was that piss-poor shooter. So it's something to watch. But again, if you drafted Andre Drummond, you drafted him realizing that your free throws were going to be shit. And it's just been a huge, huge bonus. So it's not like, oh, it's ruined. It's ruined. My, my, my season's done if, uh, if, if Drummond starts missing free throws again. Unless you traded for him under the assumption that he is now a 75% shooter which I never thought he would be. I thought he could be a 60, 65% guy. Um, and, and we'll see. But I'm not overly concerned. Avery Bradley, 14-3 and three with a steal and a block. Okay numbers for him. Boba Marjanovic came on in the first half with uh, Al Jefferson doing some damage for the Pacers. Did his customary thing. 9-4 and four with a block in 9 minutes. That's great per minute production, but the guy can't stay on the court. He, he can't move defensively. He can't um, run out big minutes. He played zero minutes in the second half, and this is a game with John Luer out, with Stan Johnson out, of course, and with Eric Moreland getting toasted. So no real hope to see anything here from Boban. Uh, Langston Galloway had 12 in his 22 minutes, while Reggie Bullock, he started in place of Stan Johnson and did a really good Stan Johnson impersonation. Seven points on a 9% usage rate with three assists and a steal. But that look, I found him available in 30-team leagues, so I added him because he's been a regular part of the rotation and his minutes were going to increase with Stan out. And, uh, and that's something that you can have a look at. The New York Knicks and the Orlando Magic. No Porzingis, unfortunately. So the Knicks started Mick Beasley at power forward. He had four points in 20 minutes. Remember when, um, oh man, if Mello gets traded, Beasley, he's going to be a 12-team league guy. Turns out he's just not good. Massive shock for a guy that's been not good for his entire career. But he is just not good. So nothing really to see there. Jarrett Jack, 6'3 and 5 in 25 minutes. And unfortunately, he played more minutes than Frankie Nilakina. But Frank was once again the superior player. His defense is awesome. Um, his passing has been awesome. That's 17 assists for Frank in the last two games, including nine here. Seven, uh, six points, four rebounds, a steal, and a block. I am, uh, I'm in on owning him in 12-team leagues. Those assists and steal numbers by themselves are useful. He seems to know his role offensively. I just need Hornacek to go, cool, you're getting 28 a night. And by December, it is going to happen. I am ready to guarantee that. And of course, the guarantee has absolutely no legal standing whatsoever. But Frank is going to get these more minutes. The assists are coming. The steals are coming. Rebounds are fine. He's getting some scoring, but it's going to be a problem. And the field goal percentage is going to be an issue, but fine with owning him. Dougie McDirt, 30 minutes for Doug. 13 and 2 in a true McDirt stat line. Two rebounds, one assist, zero steals, zero blocks, three triples in that time. But he got the extra playing time with Porzingis out, so don't get overly excited there. While the cock monster Kylo Quinn had 8, 4, and 4 in his 20 minutes. Um, not much else to talk about with the Knicks. Mindagos Kuzminskas played for the first time this season. He looks like he's going to be a real chance of getting waived when Joachim Noah comes back, which is going to be this Sunday. Um, and someone has to be waived by 5 p.m. Sunday. And I would say Kuzminskas is the favorite to, uh, to be waived to keep Jarrett Jack on that roster. For the Magic... They just had massive performances from numerous players. I said that they had you know, a ton of guys. At one point, they had uh, three. They had the top three players in the overall performances for Monstrous Line of the Night, and they had four out of the top seven guys. Nick Vucevic, 24-5 and five with four steals and a block and three triples. Fantastic. Evan Fournier, 23-2-5 and five with five steals and a block in 34 minutes. Also fantastic. And after that shit shooting night he had the other night, he went off. Oh, Screw this, I'm a 50% three-point shooter, apparently, and went out and hit three of six from three. Once again, it just the efficiency of these guys is out of control. As Gordon, 21-4-1, four, four triples and a block on 73% shooting. What on earth is going on with these Magic guys? They are killing it. And, the, and of course, the return of Lord Alfred Payton, straight into the starting lineup after there was some weird reporting from the Magic guys. Um, no, he's going to start, but he hasn't been cleared yet, so we're not sure. Cool. He's not going to have a minutes restriction, but we're just going to watch him, and then we'll we'll, uh, we'll monitor what his minutes are. So, so yeah, a um, um, a minutes restriction. Cool. Just just be honest with it. Regardless, Peyton played 29 minutes, had 11, 6, and 11, had two steals, two blocks, shot 57% from the field. If he's on your waiver wire, look, just don't allow that to happen. Go and add him. I cannot understand why Fournier is owned in only 88% of leagues and Peyton's owned in only 82. Go and add him. It just it, There's no reason for Peyton to be on the wire. 
DJ Augustin is also not going to be the starter when he comes back, uh, contrary to what Zach Lowe believed. Terence Ross, 6-2-3. and three. Shout out to Zach Lowe. I'm not, uh, not saying that he was wrong in his thinking, but there's no way that Augustine's going to start over Peyton. Terence Ross, 6-2-3 and three, with a pair of threes and a pair of steals. He's not a 12-team league guy. Well, John Simmons, I don't believe he is either. Despite 16 points in 24 minutes, he just doesn't do enough in the other areas. It came on 60% shooting, which is unsustainable. And he's just not going to get enough minutes. He's had opportunities to be playing here 29 to 30 a night. And while they love what he does, they just don't give him enough playing time. So I don't think he's a 12-team league guy. While my man, John Isaac, three games in a row with over 20 minutes of playing time. Now, it's not really doing anything for your standard leagues. 4-2-2 four, two, and two for John, but he's going to be real good. Um, he, is, he is going to be very, very good. And I'm really excited to see how, how good he looks and how good his defense looks immediately. The Lakers and the Celtics, Julius Randle, he did some damage in 21 minutes, 16 and 12 with a steal. But um, it's pretty clear that there is zero chance that he's going to be on this team next year. And they are playing that way. Uh, yeah, they're, they're playing him that way. Well, we're not going to play you big minutes. Larry Nance is out. He balls out, plays 21 minutes only. Now, that's okay in terms of value-wise, but he's, there is just no, no upside with him here. Now, you can own him in 12-team leagues, but... If he can't get 25 minutes a night, and if Andrew Bogut can play over him, then there is there's no reason for for optimism in thinking that Randall's going to get yeah you know, huge minutes um, as we move forward. I, I, I don't think you can have that sort of um, optimism. Jordy Clarkson continues to just have an insane usage: 27 minutes, 18 and five, two steals. 54% from the field, 27% usage. Um, at one point, this usage and efficiency is going to go down. He's fine to own at this point, but it is going to drop off. Loving what I'm seeing from Brandon Ingram, 18-7 and seven with two steals. He should be owned clearly, while Contavious Caldwell-Pope, they're just a very KCP line, 12-3-3 three and three with a steal and a block. Brookie Lopez, four fouls in 18 minutes after two games in a row of 30-plus minutes. 10 and 4 with a pair of blocks. That's still okay. Um, still need to hold on to him, obviously. While Kyle Kuzma, future MVP Kyle Kuzma, he cooled off a bit. Now, I reckon you're going to see a few more of these games as teams start to really scout him. Now, he still looks really fluid with his footwork. But part of the problem is, is when you, when a lot of your value is coming from really high percentage scoring and other teams then figure that out, if you're offering nothing else, now he's offering some rebounds, that's fine. He had 10 and 6 here, but when you give no assists, steals, or blocks your fantasy value is going to sink pretty quickly. Now, he still, still should be owned, but just watch for a, for a decline from uh, from Kuzma. On to the Celtics. No Al Horford with a concussion, and then Jason Tatum left before halftime with an ankle problem. Tatum is going to receive an MRI on Thursday to figure out what is wrong. I would expect maybe a couple of games absence. Hopefully, it's not too serious. But with Tatum likely to miss some time, Terry Rozier, Marcus Smart, they are going to get bumps in their value. So you might want to look at adding Rozier in a 12-team league even if uh, if Tatum is out and, of course, if Horford remains out. With Horford out, Bainesy started 21-8. and eight. He looked unstoppable on the boards in this one, Aaron Baines, 23 minutes. And we've seen from his time in San Antonio to his time in Detroit when he replaces the starter and plays as a center and gets big minutes, he's really good. And if Horford is going to miss time, Baines can have some okay value. In your deeper leagues, you want to look at uh, Vanilla Tice, as I was told his nickname is, Daniel Tice, who had 8-5 and five with two steals and three blocks. He'll get some of those extra minutes, but that has to be a, a deeper league situation. While Rozier, 14-8 and eight in 28 minutes. Marcus Smart did his thing, and by his thing I mean shot terribly, but had four rebounds, six assists, one steal, one block, and hit two triples. Marcus Morris, 18 points. 15 shots, no other numbers. This is what he does, a high-volume scorer. And he's going to get a bit of a boost now that Horford is out for whatever long he's out. And same with Tatum. I just don't think that he is a long-term 12-team league guy. But again, if anyone can make him a 12-team league guy, it will be Brad Stevens. And Jalen Brown, uh, yeah, shit house. 9-11 and 11 on 27% shooting, only one steal. Hit his free throws, so that was all right. Three of four from the line from Jalen, but still needs to be held. But yeah, that top 50 upside stuff is not happening. The Miami Heat and the Phoenix Suns. Tyler Johnson, he was sick. He didn't attend shoot around. Are you going to play? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to play. I'm going to play. Um, 7 o'clock rolls around, 7.01. Tyler Johnson will not play. So, uh, so yeah, uh, about that. And then the Heat really shortened the rotation. Just used an eight-man rotation in this one. Hassan Whiteside, 23 and 10, a steal and four blocks. The free throws were a real pain, but that's some big numbers. While the iron shoulder, he loves playing Phoenix. And again, it's not necessarily a revenge factor. 
it's a familiarity factor in Phoenix, and it's the fact that they're not good. 29, 9, and 4 for Dragic. How's our boy Jimmy Johnson? This was a guy that I used to have a massive fantasy boner for back in the days when he played on Chicago, and of course they stuffed that up. Then when he was out of the league and then came to Memphis and was putting up numbers and doing the same in Toronto, and I'd be constantly saying, just give this guy minutes, just give him more minutes, but no, it wouldn't happen. And finally now, at the age of 30, it's happening. 15, 7, and 5, two steals and two triples, just absolutely crushing it at the moment, a real integral part of what Miami does. The other good thing about Miami, and I did mention this yesterday, but Justice Winslow handling the ball looks fantastic. When the ball's in his hand, it looks really good. And he moved from the starting shooting guard with Dion Waiters out. Waiters came back and he moved to the starting power forward, taking Okaro White from starter to completely out of the rotation. Winslow played 37 minutes, 14, 6, and 5 with a steal and two triples. And I don't hate adding him in 12 team leagues. He looked really good these last couple of games. The passing and the assists are really valuable. And if they're going to stick with him at power forward, which they absolutely should, if they're going to stick Jimmy Johnson off the bench, fine. Kelly Olenek, I don't think a 20-minute roll is going to be happening for him. 18 minutes, 10 and 9, while Waiters had 16, 3 and 3. And the scoring's nice. He just, I don't know, he's just not a good fantasy player. He should be owned still. Now, everyone's really, really on Josh Richardson. Man, he's shit. He's terrible, 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 terrible. And 4 and 6 with a steal is pretty terrible. But he's the 97th ranked player this season, despite shooting 28% from 3 and 38% from the field. So he is still doing stuff in the other categories. He's blocking shots. He's getting some assists. His rebounds are okay. He's getting steals. And he has got much more upside to get. I don't care what his usage is. Yeah, the scoring, whatever, that's fine. Like his usage could go up. But once the shot comes back, if he starts hitting 45%, then he he vaults to be a, a top 70 player. And that's pretty much the value of where you drafted him. So I'm still holding tight. The minutes really aren't going anywhere. He fouled out in this one in 29 minutes. His defense has been absolutely fantastic for the majority of this season, and the fantasy value is still actually there. The Duke Wayne Ellington hit four triples for 15 points in 34 minutes with Tyler Johnson out of this one. Onto the Suns, there was no Tyson Chandler, so Alex Len started. He got four fouls in, or three fouls in about two minutes, so that limited him to like 19 minutes overall, six and three uh, there. And with Chandler out, with Len limited, Marquis Chris got some more playing time. 9-9 nine and nine in 24 minutes for Chris. A steal and a block, but still not good. Fouled out, as he always does. Not really a 12-team league guy. Dragon Bender, he played extra minutes. 27 minutes, 5-2, and two, but he's not a standard league guy either. While Josh Jackson's value continues to plummet. 5 points in 11 minutes. There is no reason you want to hold Josh Jackson in any sort of non-keeper league. 12, 14-team leagues. He's gone in those ones. TJ Warren is significantly better, and he had 16-6 and six in this one. Mike James is the point guard that you do want to own, but be aware that this 18-4-3 performance on 55% shooting is far from the norm. He's very likely to score 20% or shoot 20% and have seven points in the next game, and then Euless will look a bit better. But on the overall scheme of things, James has been the better option to Euless. And Euless is in this sort of uh, weird backup role. But it's not going to be that James is a consistent guy that is an absolute must-own guy. Fine. And look, someone asked me today, Josh, you know, you say must-own. And you know, when I say must-own, it means if he's on the wire, you have to grab him. And then I say should own. And it means he should be owned by someone in your league. And he shouldn't be on a wave wire, but someone should own him. And then I say it's fine to own him. He can be owned. He's ownable. And all those things mean the same thing. That if you sent me a screenshot of your team and I saw that bloke on the roster, I wouldn't say, mate, are you okay? Like, why is this bloke on your roster? Like, I wouldn't be saying that. Like, if you sent me a 10-team league and you had Gorgie Jeng on your roster, I'd be like, mate, probably want to move on from Gorg. Like, it's not going on with him. So that's what, when I say someone's ownable, so if you sent me a screenshot and Mike James was on it, I'd be like, all right, all right, that's fine, that's fine. But I wouldn't say, oh my God, everyone, go rush and grab Mike James. So that's the difference. Must own. You've got to own him. Alfred Payton is a must own. You've got to own him, unless your team is just unbelievably strong. Joshy Richardson, he should be owned. And if you've got him, you hold him. A guy that's ownable, that's fine to own, Mike James. And even Tyler Eulis in that same category. Even Marque- Marquise Chris is in that, yeah, it's fine. But not a guy that has to absolutely be held on to. The last game of the night, the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Golden State Warriors. And I'm ready to officially declare it. Tom Thibodeau is a bad coach and he's a shit GM. 
he has done nothing with his Timberwolves team over the past two years. He has questionable coaching practices that drive players into the ground, make them unhappy some of the time as well, and really do create injury problems. He is not a good coach. He is a terrible GM. The decisions he has made, apart from the Jimmy Butler trade, and the fact that they they weren't going to do the trade to get Butler, um, unless the Bulls chucked in pick 16, is ridiculous. You're getting Jim Butler. Fine, whatever. Jamal Crawford, Taj Gibson, these other guys they brought in. They don't make sense with this team. Um, and the fact that the, this team was down 25 points with three minutes left and his starters were still in the game is a fireable offense. Now, he can't. he's not going to get fired because he's the GM and the owner's not necessarily going to step in here. But that is tantamount, tantamount to um, self-sabotage. W- what's the point of it? And then Andrew Wiggins comes off hurts his wrist and sitting on the bench with an ice pack on as they're down 20 points with two minutes left. If Wiggins is hurt, that is a disgraceful performance from Thibodeau. Now, no, that's what he does. I don't give a shit that's what he does. Either get with the program or, you know, if kids are listening, cover their ears, get with the program or get the fuck out of the league. Really, it's 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 indefensible. Are you going to teach him a lesson? It is bullshit. And that is all I've got to say. Now, as for the actual breakdown, Wiggins, 17-6-3 with four steals. One of the better Andrew Wiggins games, especially giving you those six boards and four steals while Carl anthony Towns only played 27 minutes, and this is what happens to centers against the Warriors. Said this so many times, 16-12 and 12 for Towns. He's still a good number, but this is just the, what happens, and that enabled Gorgie Jeng to get more playing time. Remember, Jeng only plays when Towns is off the court. They split the center minutes evenly, 8-7 and seven for Jeng, not a 10, not a 12-team league guy. Um, Jeff Teague. My name is Jeff. He's fine. He's not good. He's fine. He's 14-1-5 with two steals. Poor percentage night for him. While Jim Butler, the panic on Jim Butler is high again. 11-3-5 with two steals. You can get him at an extraordinarily low rate. Someone told me that they were offered Jim Butler in exchange for Brook Lopez. Now, if you're getting the chance to get Jim Butler in exchange for Jim for, for Brook Lopez... That is just craziness. So look at the Jim Butler owner. Now, there are a few things that are happening. It's poor coaching to have him not be you know, the main guy on this team, the main ball handler. So he took fewer shots than both Wiggins and Teague, and that's not that's not on. He should be handling the ball. He should be taking more shots. He, should be, he didn't take a single free throw attempt, and that's one of the biggest reasons why his value is way down this year. But that's mainly because he's not having the ball and driving as much. He's doing more spot-up shooting, and he's not a spot-up shooter. That is poor coaching. It's very similar to the way Kevin Love is used in, in Cleveland. You're having Dwayne Wade and Derek Rose do whatever bullshit they do to take the plays out of the more talented players' hands. As for Butler, we saw Thibodeau screw this up last year with Rubio. Rubio would come down, just give the ball to Wiggins and Levine and let them you know, piss fart around for, for 10 seconds while Rubio stood in the corner, and it didn't work. And then when they, Rubio got the ball, shit actually started working, and, and Towns looked better, and Rubio looked good, and the team looked much better. At some point, this will be figured out, but it's a great buy-low opportunity for Jim. Now, I don't think he'll return to the Chicago level of Butler Butler numbers because he is taking a back seat, and some of that's on him as well. And the assist probably won't get back to the same level, but it should. But I don't think it will. But it's a really good buy-low opportunity for Jim. On to the Warriors. No Kevin Durant. Clay Thompson had 28-5 and five with six triples, a strong game there. While Draymond only scored seven, but had six boards, six assists, and two blocks. And the minutes were spread all over the place. We had numerous minutes. We had, I think, five centers play. Looney, Bell, McGee, and Zaza, and Dave West. So five centers played. That's It's just really hard to know what uh, Kerr is going to do on every night. And Nick Young was back in the rotation um, with Durant out. He had three triples with four steals and five assists. That is as fluky a Nick Young line as you will ever get. Not much more to see with this Warriors team. Iguodala started and had 11-3 and three, but played just the 20 minutes. And I've talked about Steph and Omri Caspi already. All right, that, uh, that does it for all of um, Wednesday's five-game action. I'm going to be back in a, in a minute or so, and then we're going to preview the how many games? The five games we've got on Thursday. But before I do that, there is uh, another another band who sent some song in songs in, and it is uh, it's called the band is called Ned and the Dirt, and the song that I'm going to play from Ned and the Dirt is called Stay Trashed, Stay Raring. So here it is, Ned and the Dirt, and I'll be back to talk DFS. <laughs> Yeah. 
All right, that was Ned and the Dirt with uh, Stay Trashed, Stay Raring. Let's now talk DFS by starting with the perfect DFS lineups from Wednesday on Fangio, Goran Dragic, the Iron Shoulder, 44.8. Steph had 47.6. Timmy Hardaway had 40.7. Devin Booker, 48.6. Evan Fournier, 46.9. Justice Winslow, 30.7. Toby Harris had 36.1. And Julius Randle had 35.4. While Hassan Whiteside had 48.5. And, and that was 379.3. Quite a low total, as was expected with that FanDuel pricing. And that cost 59600 On DraftKings, Lord Alfred Payton had 43.5. Fournier, 44.5. Booker, 47.25. Randle, 37. Bainsey had 34.5. Dragic, had 46.25, Tim Hardaway 43.75, and Whiteside had 47 for a total of 343.75, and that cost $49,700 reduce. Let's now move on to talk about the games that we do have on Thursday, another five-game slate. It's, a five-game slate's pretty good for DFS. Maybe maybe six is, is a better option, but uh, can't really complain about having the five games when you can really dig into them and, uh, and do some research. Um, let's look at this first one, the Lakers at the Wizards. The Wizards are favored by 10.5. The Lakers coming off that back-to-back. The total is 221 points in this one. Let's look at the point guards. Of course, Lonzo Ball is at 6,500 for all the uh, all the shit that we give Lonzo. He still put up 37 points today, and I think he's worth a GPP look. Um, don't feel great about it, but the minutes are definitely there. And at some point, the shots are going to fall in one game. It won't be a consistent thing, but it'll happen in one game and then add that to the assists and some steals and blocks. And it can be valuable, but I don't like trusting it. As for Johnny Wall at $10,000 he dues, I think a 50 is really what you're looking for here from uh, from John. So that's, a, that, that's worth a look, especially after he was a little bit down the last time he matched up against Lonzo. Timmy Frazier, not really worth the look. At shooting guard, Contavious Caldwell-Pope is always a GPP guy at 4,700. Although recently, his numbers have looked yeah, pretty consistent. Don't buy into it. The, any, a shitful night could be coming at any point. I like Bradley Beal, and I like Jordan Clarkson for cash games and for tournaments. Clarko's at 4,400, just getting up his shots, and that's really helpful for DFS, while Beal at 8,100. Apart from last game where, where he only had 28, yeah, he's just he's averaging 41 across the last three, 39 across the last five, so some pretty decent consistency for Brattles Beal. You've also got Jody Meeks, who's an okay minimum salary GPP punt who can come out there and hit your four or five triples, but his minutes have definitely been reduced recently. At small forward, I like Ingram at 6,200. That's for cash and tournaments. While Ubre at 4,000, really with the minutes dropping down, you know, paired that with his consistency problems, I think he's more of a, a GPP sort of a guy. At power forward, Mark if Morris is at 4,500. I actually really like him at this price. A really a good matchup for him. His third game back for the season. The minutes should come up. I think you're looking at 30 point upside here, which at 4,500 is good. Randall at 4,500, putting up really good numbers. The minutes are going to be limited, but he's still getting his stats, so I think he is fine to use as well. While Otto Porter at 6,700. Otto can go off, but that's too expensive for me in cash, so I look at him as a tournament guy. Same with the 6,300 that you have to pay for our future MVP, Kyle Kuzma. At center, you've got Marching Gortat at 5,500. He had 14 points in 25 minutes in the last game, so those minutes are on the way down. Look at him as a GPP guy. He has had a pretty good record against the Lakers, but I don't trust him with Morris's minutes on the way up. And Brookie Lopez at 6,900, just a just just a smidge too expensive to have a have a crack at Brook there at that sort of a price. Over on DraftKings, the tournament guys are like here: Lonzo at 6,000, KCP and Otto Porter with March and Gortat at 5,600 as a tournament guy. And for cash, it's Markeith, it's Wall. Kuzma, a, a much better play, I believe, over on DraftKings with his ability to get the double-double. Brandon Ingram, Brattles Beal, and Geordie Clarkson in play over there as well. Let's move on to the next game now. It is the New Orleans Pelicans and the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors are favored by four, so five, and the total is 214.5 points. Let's talk point guards. Drew and Kyle Lowry, both of those guys are more tournament plays. If I had to take one of them for cash, it would probably be Kyle. Drew is at 6,500 and, and uh, Kyle is at 7,500. Lowry's got a very good record against the Pelicans. The new offense hasn't 100% suited his fantasy game, but yeah, a 35-point outing for him on a five-game slate is not a, not a tough ask. D-line Wright's there at 3,700. don't really feel too much good about that. At shooting guard, DeMar DeRozan, I love that at 7,900. I feel like he just gets 35 pretty much every night. Well, each one more at 4,000 does not appeal to me. Norm Powell, 4,000 bucks. Everyone back in the rotation, it is hard to consider him a reliable option. 
3,200 for Tone Allen as a small forward. He's getting the minutes, but the stats aren't really coming for Tone. But a four-steal guy, which he could be, with the three points now on Fangio for those steals, it's worth considering for a tournament, but that's probably about it. Same with CJ Miles, who's literally minimum salary, and he can get he can have a 5-3-5 steal night, CJ Miles, and that would be brilliant at that $3,000 price tag. Don't really care too much for Darius Miller or OG Ananobi. At Power Forward, Serge Ibaka, 5000 bucks looks appealing, but he's been shitful for the majority of this season, but I'm okay here using him in a tournament-type situation. Love Tone Davis at 11900 as well. At center, Valanchunas at 4,900. Killed it in the last game, but I really do fear the Boogie Davis matchup plus whatever bullshit um, Dwayne Casey's going to run. So I'd look at him as a tournament guy only, while Boog for cash is really strong at 11,700. And you know, getting 60 out of him should not be considered a, a stretch. If you want to go tournament looking as well, say JV gets into foul trouble, which is a pretty common occurrence against Boog, maybe you want to throw Bebe in there at 3,200. If he gets 20 minutes, he's going to smash that value, and there is a chance that that could happen. So he's a guy to, to pay a level of attention to. Over on DraftKings, tournament guy Jameer Nelson is, is more of an option on DraftKings at 3,900, a real strong price. And then you've got a bunch of cash players, Ibaka, Lowry, Holiday, Cousins, and Tone Davis with, um, yeah, maybe you take that flyer on CJ Miles, but he is at 3,400 on DraftKings as opposed to minimum salary on FanDuel. Let's uh, go to the next game now. It's the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Houston Rockets. The Rockets are favored by five, and the total is 228. We need to check on the status of Luke Marmute. I would say that he will be ready to go. If he doesn't go, it's more minutes for guys like PJ Tucker, who, who got some extra playing time in that last one, or some of those additional point guards, Bob Brown, Demetrius Jackson, Jackson, maybe one of those guys get some extra playing time. At point guard, we do have Derek Rose for the Cleveland Cavaliers. He is at 4,500. He is averaging a robust 18 points across his last five games and 16 over his last three. I still think he is worth a GPP look, but there is zero chance that I'd want to use him in any cash lineups. At shooting guard, Jim Harden at 11-2. Pretty much any guard or wing play going up against the Cavs is having massive, massive nights. Jim's got a good record against the Cavs prior to this. I think that you're looking at a really, probably the best of all the $11,000 players out there for Jim Harden. Dwayne Wade's at 4,700 and J.R. Smith's at 39. Both of those guys have been okay recently, but I just don't trust it in a, in a cash situa- situation. While Eric Gordon at 6,300 is way too expensive for cash. For a tournament, yeah, look, he could drop a 45. I just don't have a, a great level of confidence in that. And Kyle Korver's in that tournament mix also. At small forward, Trevor Ariza at 5,700. If Mar Mute is out, I'd feel a little bit more confident in using Ariza and to get that 28 or 29, but he's not really a high ceiling guy, and he's not all that all that high in his floor, but I'd feel okay about using him in cash, especially if Mar Mute is out. PJ Tucker at 42, nah, not for me, although it is the Cavs. Anyone can do anything, apparently. Well, uh, well Jeff Green... My name is Jeff. Is at 3,600, and I'm not really interested there. But LeBronald, 11,800. LeBron James. Um, yeah, I would much rather take Jim uh, or Boog or Tone Davis than LeBron, but LeBron is still in play um, at, at that salary. It's just a little bit too high, I think. At power forward, Ryan Anderson, he is a tournament type of player. While Luke Marmute, I don't really see it there. Jay Crowder, also in a GPP, but he has been he's been Derek Rowe's levels of shitful. 15-point average over the last five. At $4,000, there is some upside there for Crowder for sure, but I, I don't trust it. And then you got, uh, then you got oh, no, I was going to say you got Kevin Love, but he's a center. Let's get on to Kevin Love now, actually. He's at 7,300 coming off a 63-point game. Will Ty Lu actually get him involved in the offense and let him do his thing? Or will the Ahad and Capella pick and roll just burn him to the ground? With Tristan Thompson out, you would hope that they just have to stick with Love. I would look at him at 7,300 and have a, a decent level of confidence in using him. The other centers, of course, is Capella, 6,800. I like the matchup here for Clint, and I think that a 30-plus night should be, uh, should be pretty comfortable for Clint Capella. Over on DraftKings, um, I like Marmute, Smith, Anderson, and Rose as your tournament options. Harden, James, Capella, and Love as tournament and cash. And Trevor Ariza, not really a high upside guy, but 4,700 is a sensational price on DraftKings, so I'd be all over using him at that sort of a salary. Let's move on to the next game now. Um, we are looking at the uh, Philadelphia 76ers and the Sacramento Kings. Joel Embiid didn't practice, so we want to check to see whether he's actually going to play. I assume he will. 
But if he doesn't play, then it's another opportunity for Rishon Holmes to throw into a GPP and definitely have a look at Dario Saric in that sort of a scenario. The Sixers are favored by six and a half after the Sacramento Kings had that big win against the Thunder. The total is 205, which is the lowest of the day. But that's not to say there's no value here. TJ McConnell at 5,400. I feel pretty good about that for cash. Um, maybe not a massive upside in tournaments, but pretty strong for cash. Well, Georgie Hill is down to 3,800 because he has been dreadful, averaging 15 over the last five. But I, I can't exclude him from a tournament pool at that price. We know that yeah, he can easily drop a 30, and that could really be a game changer. But the likelihood of it happening is pretty low. Now, 5,400 for De'Aaron Fox. I just don't see the value in that. Garrett Temple playing almost the most minutes per night for the Kings. He's at 3,900. There is some upside there, but only a tournament type of guy. JJ Redick at 4,900. I think that's just too expensive to rely upon him in cash. He, he can go go hot, but he's been pretty hot in the last couple of games and still only averaging 27 points over the last three, which is marginally above that 4,900. Bogdan Bogdanovich, I, I just I don't know what to expect from this team, to be honest. Well, Bud healed at 4,700. He's been strong off the bench. I'd be okay with using Bud at 47. At small forward, Bob Cubs at 6,400. Covington has got a good record against the Kings. He's playing well. I think he's uh, I think he's a fairly strong play uh, in this on this slate here. While the other small forwards, Justin Jackson, went off in the last one, and maybe you want to rely upon that, but I don't. At power forward, Zach Randolph, 4,700. The minutes are coming his way incorrectly, but they are coming his way. Now, it doesn't matter that he can't do anything defensively. 4,700 for Zebo, averaging 28 over the last three. I'm in on that. Now, this could be the game replaced 12 minutes, but I'm not really thinking that's going to be the case. And Ben Simmons, 9,900. It's so expensive, but he just keeps exceeding value. And if Embiid is out, I would smash that. As for Sharich at 4,100, Embiid's out. He comes into a cash play. Embiid is in. I would look at him as a tournament type guy. I imagine he will stick starting with Jared Bayless out, and I just cannot find any justification for using Skull Le Bissier. At center, Embiid at 9,600. Smash that if he is playing. Really, really like both him and Simmons. While well, Corley Stein at 4,900, I, I don't see the upside there. Same with Kufos. And Rashawn Holmes down to 3,300. If Joel is out, which is a possibility, and if you're crafting a GPP lineup and we haven't heard about Embiid status, I would put Holmes into one of my lineups because I think his ownership will be very, very low. And then if he pops off and gives you a 30, which is a possibility if he gets to play 27 minutes, you are, you're you looking pretty strong. So he is a guy to take a look at, maybe with a, a Simmons and Holmes stack in one of your GPP lineups. But if you're only putting one GPP lineup in, I wouldn't be really looking at Holmes in that case. The oh, I was going to say, let's go to the next game, but we need to talk the DraftKings action for this one. Tournaments, Temple, Fox, Georgie Hill, and Sharich. And there's a ton of cash guys that I like. Embiid, Simmons, Reddick, Covington, McConnell, Zebo, and Bud Heald, also an option over on DraftKings. Let's have a look at this uh, last game of the night. It is the Oklahoma City Thunder traveling to Denver. The Thunder are favored by one, and the total is 215.5 points. At point guard, Russ is at 10,500. Just not really living up to that level of, of price, but... We know what he's done against Denver before, so I'm okay with using him here. The Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray, 4,800, just definitely not interested in in that outside of a tournament. No cash love whatsoever. Manny Moutier and Fat Face Ray Felton, who my brother, as you know, has been living in America. He came home two days ago, had dinner with him last night, and one of the first things he said to me, because he goes, I hope you're not, uh, I hope you're not claiming credit for the Fat Face Ray Felton nickname, because that is one of his. So, Jordan. Full, uh, full credit to you for the fat face Ray Felton nickname. That is yours. Obviously, you've been seething on that for two years that I've been dropping that in the podcast without proper attribution. So there you go. Fat face Ray Felton. Copyright, Jordan Lloyd. So to Ray, if you're listening, not me. It's my brother. At shooting guard, Andre Robertson. The minutes are there. The production is not. There's just no upside really with him. Farton, Will Barton, 5,900. 33-point average over his last three. I feel pretty good about locking in Barton here, while Gaz Harris at 5,900. Nice, I think he is pretty good as well, but I wouldn't feel as confident uh, with him. If I'm choosing between him and Barton, I would take Barton over Harris, which is really, really tough for me to say. At small forward, Paulie George at 8,000 bucks, probably more of a tournament guy, while old baby neck Wilson Chandler at 43. There's just nothing to like about that. At power forward, Jeremy Grant, 41. The minutes are there. The production is not, so maybe a tournament, but don't feel strongly. Mallow at 68, I, I like, and Paulie Millsap at 7,200. I feel like actually okay about using Paulie Millsap at that sort of a salary also. At center, we've got Steve Adams and Nikola Jokic. Jokic is at $10,000. Um, 
probably a bit high for me. It's a big price rise, and the Adams defense can be a concern. As for Adams at 6,600, maybe a little bit too high there for Steve at that price. They did have a big game in the last one, but that was fueled by five steals, which is not a replicable event. So I'll probably fade both of those centers on Fangio. On DraftKings tournament guys, Jeremy Grant's more of a tournament option on DraftKings. Mallow and Millsap more tournament guys over there too. Well, for cash, Paulie George, Jokic is much better. 8,600, that's fantastic. Uh, Gaz Harris, Steve Adams, and Farton Will Barton all come in at significantly cheaper prices over on DraftKings as well. Let's have a look at the uh, the other sites here. On Yahoo, let's talk about some tournament guys. J.R. Smith, Etwan Moore, the Blue Arrow, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Normie Powell, Budrick Heald, Steve Adams, Bebe Noguera, Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic. There's some uh, tournament guys, and then you've got the other players. Garrett Temple, Jameer Nelson, PJ Tucker, Markeith Morris, Farton, Will Barton, McConnell, Ingram, Gaz Harris, Zebo, Jim Harden, Johnny Wall uh, are useful for tournaments and for cash games on Yahoo. On Moneyball, your tournament guys, I think Andre Robertson is worth a look, Serge Barker, J.R. Smith, Joel Embiid, Ryan Anderson, Sharich, Lonzo, um, probably the more GPP focused guys and you look at the guys who are valuable in both I think Mark Keith, Garrett Temple, Jim Harden Zach Randolph, Trevor Ariza Benny Simmons, Russ Westbrook, Brandon Ingram Budrick Heald, Farton Will Barton Julius Randall, Paulie George, Nikola Jokic Tone Davis, Jordy Clarkson Drew Holiday and Boog Cousins and then over on Draft Stars Tournament guys, J.R. Smith Garrett Temple, Joel Embiid Paulie George, Serge Ibaka, Carmelo Anthony and for cash and tournament plays, TJ McConnell, Jameer Kuzma, future MVP Kyle Kuzma, Jeremy Grant, Benny Simmons, Trevor Ariza, Jim Harden, Kyle Lowry, Drew Holiday, Jokic, Gaz, Johnny Wall, Russ Westbrook, Stevie Adams, Brandon Ingram, DeMar DeRozan, Farton Will Barton, Otto Porter, Boog, Julius Randle, and rounding it out with Tone Davis. All right, that wraps it up for today's show. If you are watching this on YouTube, subscribe. Hit that little bell so you get the notifications when a new video comes out. Give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. And if you are listening to the audio version on Apple Podcasts, leave a review, five stars. Leave a five-star review. Actually, don't leave a review. Leave a five-star review. That would be awesome if you could support the show that way. You can also find us on Spotify, Google Play, TuneIn, and Stitcher, and check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network. We are done here, guys.